Hey, how's it going, Raphael? Hello, teacher. Hello, Pam. Perfect. <laughs> Good to see you. How's life? Good to see you, too. It's difficult for me in the last weeks joining your classes and other classes because I am very busy. But today I have, uh -huh. I think, only three quarters of hours, but um, I try to to practice my English in your classes. <laughs> That's awesome. No, thank you. Welcome. Mm, thank you. Uh, How's everything going in Madrid? Yeah, yeah, pretty well. <laughs> With some pretty well. Huh? That's great. That's great. Uh, we're probably going to just be um, we'll be hanging out for maybe a couple more minutes, Rafael, before we start. Yeah. Uh, okay. Someone else might join. Yeah. Okay. Um, there was uh, something I read about in the news recently. I don't know if it was about Spain or another country, I don't remember. Um, it, it might not have been about Spain, actually. Uh, I think I was speaking about Spain to somebody. I think you remember telling, I think I remember telling, uh, or you telling us that you were going to go to Seville in the yeah. South Sevilla. Yeah, How was I, that trip? I, oh, very nice. It, <clears throat> it, uh, it was... There were a long time I didn't go to Sevilla and it's very nice, it's beautiful with a lot of old ancient buildings and you can walk on the street to everywhere mm -hmm. uh, with a lot of bars and pubs and restaurants and enjoy with tapas. <laughs> I don't know if you know what is yeah, tapas. Yeah. It's a tapas, little yeah. piece, yeah, little piece of bread with um, um, with another thing on on it. Mm -hmm. Delicious, and the people is very friendly, and the weather was <coughs> amazing because um, there were well, many people that said the um, in Sevilla in Seville the the sun looks in another way. Um, it's a, another kind of light on the street, and it's true because I don't know why. Like in the desert, if you go to the desert, you can see the um, the light, the bright of the sun is different in some part. In mm -hmm. Sevilla, um, the brightness of the sun brightness is very different. I don't know why, <laughs> but but the people said in many times ago this sentence no about this the brightness in Sevilla and it's true I enjoy a lot I enjoyed in the past I enjoy a lot um, I can I want I want to go I want to go in another in another time and um, also uh, it's very easy because uh, from Madrid to there you can go in the in the high speed train mm -hmm. um, it's almost 300 kilometers per hour, and you can arrive, you can get Sevilla in less than two hours and a half. It's very easy and very comfortable to to go in this kind of train. Mm -hmm. That's awesome, actually. Yeah. yeah. Where are you? In, in Florida, in Miami? <laughs> I'm actually... <laughs> <On the mountains. laughs> I'm in... I'm in... Uh, I'm in Los Angeles right now, actually. So uh, you continue yeah. that? Yeah, You're it's. Still uh, I'm still there. Yeah, I'm still in California. So uh, it's been a nice experience so far. It's. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a nice city. Uh, there's. It's. It doesn't feel like uh, as as busy as I thought it would be, but it's still nice. There it has its own kind of feel in the streets. It has its own mm -hmm. culture. You know things like yeah. that. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. So. And when you return back you, to your city, because I. I I thought you were there only for for half a vacation with your friends. I I don't know, but <laughs> you still you want to still you want you want to be there for a long time. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think that's the plan. Uh, yeah. So yeah, we'll see. I, I'm not sure yet when, but uh, uh, yeah. maybe I'll find out over the next few weeks or something like that. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hey, Ken, how's it going? Welcome. Uh, yes, I'm fine. Thank you. How are you? Good, good, good. Thanks. Uh, so, guys, let's actually get started. Um, uh, 
Well, today we're going to be looking at, looking at a class that focuses on um, the different kinds of pronunciation for vowels that are um, actually vowels that come before the letter R, right? So there are numerous ways to pronounce that in English, and one of the things that I think is is a little bit difficult when we see this is certain languages. I think Spanish is probably one of the most one of the most uh, like prominent cases. I would say Spanish. You guys have many ways that you pronounce R. For example, we have the double R, like um, in the word ferrocarril, right? I mean, it's it's sometimes it's difficult for for non-native speakers to get that double R sound um, in their vocabulary. Um, in English, we have many, many times in many words, we have letters, vowels that precede R, so vowels that come right before R's. And there are differences in terms of how we pronounce them. If this sound is in the middle of a sentence, if it's at the beginning of a sentence, or if it's at the end of a sentence, right? Usually at the beginning of a sentence, it's easier. And in the middle, it's a little bit tougher. And... Um, sometimes it can actually get much more difficult, right? So we're going to focus on that first. We're going to be looking at the eight ways that we pronounce vowels that come before R, right? There are eight ways that we can do that, and then we're going to be kind of practicing that. In the second part of the class, guys, we are going to be discussing um, an article that talks about how to keep your laptop safe and secure when you travel. It's actually very important because now that we travel with so much technology, it's easy to, uh, you know, forget little things. And I'm sure we've all traveled and worried about, you know, losing losing our valuables. So we're going to be reading an article that kind of talks about that. Uh, so let's get started, guys, with the concept of the uh, the concept of these vowels that show up before ours, right? So there are eight different ways to pronounce English vowels that come before R, right? When I say vowels, guys, what do I mean by vowels? Which letters in English are the vowels? A, O, E, U. Yeah, exactly, yeah. right? <laughs> it's A, E, I, O, and U, right? So these five <laughs> letters, and we, we, we hear in English when we learn it as kids, we learn, and sometimes why. Right? So A, E, I, O, and U, for sure, these five, but also sometimes Y. Right? So there are eight different varieties of vowels that should come before Y. The first one is if you have the letter U, right, in front of the letter R. So let's look at this word, right? I'm going to write them with numbers. We're going to look at eight different cases. The first one is this case, right? So First of all, do you guys know what this word means? Per, right? Per. What does that word mean? To pour something on a cup of tea or to pour some liquid, any liquid. Uh, uh huh. It's actually, you're very close, Rafael, actually, but that's, that word that you mentioned is actually pour. It's pour, right? This is uh. per. Yeah, so there's a little bit of difference between per. Ken, do you know what per means? Uh, a kind of noise from engine? Yeah, it's a kind of noise, right? So it can be from an engine, or it can also be from a cat, right? You know when the cat kind of like, the cat is not, the cat wants to go to sleep maybe, or the cat is relaxing against somebody, or like maybe against your leg, it's just lying there, they're relaxing. Right. It can purr, right? So we use it a lot for cats, and sometimes we use it for, I guess, for engines as well, or some kind of machine, right? The machine purrs. The machine was purring along, right? Like it was, it was, it was working without any issues. It was working very well. It was making a, maybe a very low noise as it was working, you know. So could you guys help me after I say this word? I want you guys to repeat it once more. Purr. Poor. Poor. Yeah. So see how the U, it's not like the U sound, right? It's not poor, right? It's purr. 
right? So that's that's the first way, right? Wow. So this is this is when yeah, because usually when you have a U, you have either a U sound like university, the U, right? Or you have an U sound, like maybe. Um, well, the U sound does not exist so much in English. Usually we have an A sound, like U and A, like if, if it's the word unavailable, right? We say unavailable, A, uh, even though it starts with a U. Here it's kind of the same thing. We have an A sound, per, right? It's kind of a mix between an A and an U sound, right? Forget about that, right? <laughs> I don't want to confuse you guys. But in this case, it's per, right? So U, R, R, per. Okay, let's look at the second example, guys. This is when we have a... This is going to be a little bit easier, I think, right? So what about this word? What does this word mean? Uh, Paulita. Uh, oh, no, no, that's P-E-R. That one is P-E-R, exactly, yeah. like per liter, right? This is actually a little bit different. I can think of two ways that we use this word. Can one of you guys... Help me out. Maybe, Raphael, what do you think this one means? Par. Par could be um, some kind of numbers. Could be. Yeah. Um, close, right? So we, we use this when we are talking about golf, right? So maybe somebody makes a par on hole eight, right? I'm actually not super familiar with golf, but this is something that people do say like I made par, but I would actually, the more common way of using this word is when we use it in the phrase on par, on par with something, right? If something is on par with something, it's at the same level, right? So for example, a boss can say, my employees' abilities are on par with their, with their training, right? Or his abilities are on par, with his learning, right? So, so they are, somebody's ability to do something is appropriate for the amount of training that he received, right? So that's, that's how we use on par. On par is used as a way to, to talk about appropriateness. Something is on par with something else. Right? So we always have on par with, right? So let's see if we can, uh, Let's see if we can pronounce this this word, guys. Um, par. 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 <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Good job with that one, guys. So the first one was can we can we look at the first word again? Per. Per. Can anyone repeat it? Uh -huh, fantastic, Rafael. Yeah. Par. Per yeah, so it's a little bit it's a little bit different kind of sound, right? Good job with that one, guys. Let's look at the third example. This one I think you guys will know and be able to give me the definition. A word, this word. What do you guys this word means? What do you guys think this word means? Peer means acquaintances or in a workplace or in a society or. Yeah, exactly. A peer is like a colleague, or it could be a friend, you know, somebody you work with, somebody like an acquaintance, exactly. So here it's peer, right? Peer. So can you guys repeat that after me? Peer. Uh-huh. Peer. Fantastic, fantastic. So see, there are all these differences, right? All these differences between these different kinds of sounds. Um, number four. So there are five more, so let's look at this number four. This one is going to be a little bit interesting. There's actually two that I'm going to be looking at. So what about this one? First, let's, let's look at this this word. What does that mean? Pair. Pair means uh, two. Two something. Yeah, a couple, right? A couple, it can be a pair or two things, like a pair of shoes, a pair of socks, right? So, and then we have this word, right? What does that one mean? Pure. Pure. Do you guys know what that one is? It's actually a kind of fruit, right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, Asian pears, 
right? Asian pears or green pears, they are a kind of fruit that we see in um, the springtime, I think, normally, right? Um, not sure, but we can find them in supermarkets here. Uh, this is the picture of a pear, guys, right? The pronunciation of both of these words are the same, even though the spelling is different, right? So pear and pear, they're pronounced exactly the same way. But look at the differences in vowels, right? One of them has an I-R, or one of them has an E-A-I-R, the other one has an E-A-R, right? And they're both pronounced pear, right? So let's repeat that, guys. Pear. 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 Fantastic, fantastic. Any questions on these words so far, guys? We're halfway through. There's four more. No, no question. No. Good so far. Okay, um, I know this is going to be taking some. It's going to take some practice to actually master some of these sounds. We're going to be practicing them in, in in a little bit after we look at this. Um, after we look at the remaining words. What about this one, guys? Poor. Poor. Exactly. Exactly. And Raphael, what does this one mean? Poor. Something. Anybody who is without money or run out of money. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, someone without money, right? Poor. Yeah, exactly. So uh, this one, you guys, I think you guys both pronounced it correctly, right? Poor is when someone doesn't have money, right? So there are very similar words, right? Very, very, very similar words, right? At the, ver at the very beginning, we saw the word poor when we were, I think, I think, Raphael, you mentioned, you know, when somebody pours a liquid, right? So this pour and that other pour really have the same sound, right? He's a poor person, right? The poor guy poured himself a glass of whiskey, right? So this is where it gets really confusing. The poor guy poured himself a glass of whiskey, right? So the same sound, but there's, there's a different spelling. Right, poor and poor, the same exact sound. Uh, num let's look at the next one, guys. This is the sixth one. This one is going to be, I think, a little bit, a little bit challenging, right? Pyre. Er, pyre? Wow, this is a good question. Pyre. Yeah, it is pyre. What do you guys think this word means? Pyre. 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 It's related to fire when when you made uh, <clears throat> a lot of um, branches to make fire could be. <clears throat> yes, yes, exactly, exactly, Raphael. That's great, right? Pyre we use when we are talking about burning something, right? And usually we see it in the context of a funeral pyre, right? In in the old days, people would not bury. They're dead people, you know. If if somebody died, they would. Some cultures still do this, right? They they believe in cremation. They don't believe in, you know, burial, right? So when you cremate a body, when you burn a body after it dies, right? Usually the the body is taken to the funeral pyre, where they put a lot of wood and other things. They put the body inside and they put it on fire, right? Um, it's because that's you know that's some uh, there are some beliefs and some religions that believe in that, right? So let's pronounce this one again, guys. Pyre. Pyre. Right, fantastic. Rafael, do you want to pronounce it real quick? Just so we can practice it. Oh, maybe Raphael's, uh, maybe there's a connection issue. Okay, so that one is pyre, right? So let's look at the, the seventh example here. Seventh example you guys will get without any problems, right? It's the word power, right? Power. And Ken, what does power mean? Power means uh, power. Uh, strength, strength, or, yeah. Strength, yeah. yeah. Ability, right? Um, mm. High, the high, some kind of a high level of ability to do something or mm. strength, exactly yeah. power, right? Good. Uh, Raphael, are you back by any chance? 
sorry, I have to leave. I'm so sorry. Oh, no problem. See you later, Rafael. I have to Take go to, to my job. Sorry. Have a nice day. No problems. Yep, you too. Take care. Uh, so, power, right? Okay, so that one's really good, Ken. You understand what that means and can pronounce it perfectly. So that's power. And last but not least, let's look at the sound, the word, this word. I'll have you pronounce it and I'll have you tell me what the meaning is as well. Right. Pure means, mm -hmm. how can I say it? Uh, uh, no, uh, kind of unnecessary <laughs> uh, things inside or uh, I can, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I, mm? I think you get it. I think you get it. Yeah, yeah. You get it. It's just, it's, it's just very difficult to explain. Uh, pure is, you know, no, something that doesn't have bad quality, something that doesn't have anything bad in it, right? Something that is pure is clean. Oh, yeah, right? clean yeah. If I think of it that way, yeah, pure is clean. Awesome, awesome. So yeah, these are all good examples, right? These are all good examples. We see multiple types of vowels that come before the letter R, right? And all of them have differences in pronunciation. So it's really not the spelling, right? It's it's a, it's a question of really knowing that these words are pronounced this way and uh, keeping that kind of in our uh, like in the back of our minds when we are kind of pronouncing these words, right? So. Any questions on any of those so far? Uh, no, but uh, yeah, English spelling is pretty tricky. So, <laughs> so it I, is, it is. Know. But nowadays, you know, the online dictionary is, uh, you know, useful to check the pronunciation for the new words. Yeah. yeah, yeah, especially. Which one do you use normally? Uh, now I'm using, uh, mainly I use Japanese, uh, English Japanese translation, but uh, I often use uh, Oxford, maybe. Mm -hmm. Oxford is pretty good. For Strong's Urban Dictionary. Nice, nice. Yeah. It's amazing. It is amazing. I've actually contributed some definitions to Urban Dictionary. <laughs> so some of some of the things I wrote were, were, were approved of. They are very, very popular on there. So it's interesting. OK. So uh, let's look at the. So we'll take a look at some examples, Ken, and I'll I'll be going through some of these sentences, and I just want you to help me pronounce them, right? And once we do that, we can go into the articles. I think we'll be great after that. Um, so what about this word right here? So let's let's have a little break here in the middle, a, little, a different line, right? And now let's look at practicing. So what about this word, Ken? How do we pronounce mm. this word? War. Yeah, were, were, were. right? So they, there were five people in the, there were five people at the gym, right? Were. Uh -huh. What about this one? This one is going to be easy. Hard. Hard, exactly, exactly, right? What about this one? Here. Here, exactly. Here. What about this one? Hair. Hair, exactly. And what about this one? War. War, exactly. What about this one? Wire. Wire, wire, exactly. What about this one? Hour. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And this one. Tour. Tour. Yeah, Tour. fantastic. Tour. Exactly, exactly. Um, Ken, I think you got it. I think it's just some of them are, they take a little bit longer. Um, what I want to, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to, Look at when we have stuff, some of these words at the beginning and the middle and the end of sentences, right? Because sometimes it's actually, if there are other words joined with these words, it gets a little bit challenging to pronounce them in the context of other sounds, right? So let me ask you to pronounce, I'm going to give you a full sentence this time, right? And this one is when we have 
the word at the beginning of the sentence, right? So let's take a look. Okay. Uh, more workers will not help to solve the problem. Fantastic. More workers will not help to solve the problem, right? Fantastic. Um, and now, in this example, we see more is at the, at the beginning of this word. In the second example that, I, that I'm going to give to you, more is going to be at the end of the word, right? He always wanted and expect, expected more. Mm -hmm. Exactly. He always wanted and expected more, right? And now this one, more is going to be in the middle of a sentence, and the understanding is it might be a little bit tougher to pronounce. Uh, do you think that needs more time and money? Mm -hmm. Good job, good job. Absolutely. You got all of those, right? Uh, yeah. Do you think that he needs more time and more, more time and money? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So we see more at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end. Of, of these different kinds of phrases, right? So sometimes it's okay when we are pronouncing English to actually pause if you, if you feel like there's a word that you want to pronounce correctly. I think some speakers get very nervous if they run across, if they come across a word that they don't know how to pronounce. But it's okay to, to just kind of pause and observe the word if, if you want to pronounce it, you know? Um, especially at the beginning, right? There are some of those weird words like pyre, right? Um, it's it might be easier to slow down and learn the word and then pronounce it. People are not gonna, you know, take that take that in take that in the wrong way, right? So um, great job, Ken. I think you did a super job. Uh, all of the words were were easy for you when we did the practice, as well as these these three sentences. So any questions on any of these? No, it's okay. Okay, fantastic. Well, then, in that case, Ken, let us just take a look at this article. And we are looking at how do we keep our laptop safe when we travel, mm -hmm. right? Some tips from people who travel all the time, I think. And uh, they have a good understanding of what is needed when um, you are moving around, flying around, and your laptop is possibly getting... You know, possibly people are looking at it. There are thieves everywhere, right? How to keep things secure. So in this example, they're saying here, keep your laptop safe and secure while you travel. Of course, your laptop is coming with you on any holiday trips. It's your pride and joy. For many of us, it's practically an appendage. It's our entertainment at the airport and on the plane. It's our official umbilical cord because you know you can never completely escape work. Unlike an arm or leg, though, your laptop isn't physically attached to your body, and there are, t and there are all too many ways that it can come to harm or even disappear with someone who covets it as much as you do. Follow these tips for laptop security, and you won't have to ask Santa to bring you a new one. Right. So the person's being kind of funny here with all these, with all these different kinds of examples, but any questions about the vocabulary in these two uh, words? Appendage. Appendage. Appendage, yeah, fantastic. It's part it's practically an appendage. An appendage is a part of your body. Mm -hmm. Right? Think of it as the an appendage is actually the word is used primarily to talk about arms and legs. Right? So mm -hmm. our arms and legs, our head, really is an appendage that kind of sticks out, right? Mm -hmm. So you look at the, the body, main body of the human being, what sticks out? You have the two legs, the two arms, and the head, mm -hmm. right? So those are these are known as the appendages. So he's saying here, your laptop, it's your pride and joy, and for many of us, it's practically an appendage. It's practically a part of our body. What about the word, this word, umbilical, or this phrase, umbilical cord? Okay. Um. Umbri uh, umbilical cord. Mm. It's a little bit more medical than, mm -hmm. you know, like basic English. Umbilical cord is that cord that connects the mother to the baby when the baby oh, is, is born. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I got it. So, yeah, yeah. It's, it connects from, like, the, the baby's belly button to mm -hmm. the mother's, I think, placenta or something like that. Mm -hmm. So... 
it's our it's our office umbilical cord, right? It connects you mm -hmm. to your office or to your job, right? Um, and then in the next paragraph, they said covet. What do you think covet means? Covet. Covet means. This is a tough word. Who covet it much as you do? Even disappear with someone who covets. So in this case, actually, Ken, what do you think? Actually, I'll let you. I'll let you guess first, or make a make a good educated guess. Co co cover. Cover. Yeah, cover is close. Covet means somebody who really is attracted to mm. something. Really attracted, oh. really attached to something. Uh, okay. Right. So maybe long like for. the one of the yeah who longs mm. for and is attracted mm. to in 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 kind of a very strong way, right? Mm. So it's saying here, and there are all too many ways that it can come to harm, right? And there are all and there are many ways that the laptop can be harmed, mm. right? Or even disappear with someone who covets it as much as you do. So what what's he saying? How can a laptop disappear? If somebody covets it as much as you do, mm. I mean, what's he what's he saying in that in that longer sentence? This part Maybe. he's saying one thing, yeah. Uh, some more want want your laptop. Yeah, so they steal it, <laughs> yeah. right? That's all he's saying, right? It it can be harmed or it can even be stolen, mm. right? And so these are some of the ideas that he gives us. So the first thing he says is keep it padded, right? Tossing a laptop into the average backpack, book bag, or worse. Simply carrying it under your arm is asking for trouble, right? Your delicate hardware needs a purpose-built enclosure to keep it safe, mm -hmm. right? So, any questions on, on this paragraph so far? No. Makes sense, right? Um, what about enclosure? What do you think enclosure means, Ken? Mm, enclosure to keep it. She needs a uh, kind of package or pack or... Yeah, really. Anything like a like any kind of something that is closed is an enclosure, right? Mm -hmm. So a bag, a a packet, something mm -hmm. like that to keep it safe, right? Oops, I think I clicked something. Oh, I see a big picture of the bag. Okay, um, and then next it goes. Traveling is full of shoving bags into tight spots, jostling them about, and stuffing in just one more thing. Push a little too hard, and you may hear an investment shattering crack. Get a laptop-specific carrying case with plenty of padding and protection. Separate compartments for accessories and power cables are a luxury that can keep your PC scratch and dent free. Mm -hmm. To deter theft, buy a nondescript bag without logos that advertise to potential thieves that there's valuable merchandise inside. Right. So what about these two paragraphs, Ken? Mm -hmm. Bunch of big words, bunch of interesting words. Uh, maybe to keep it uh, non brand, no uh, kind of back. That's the one thing. Uh, yeah. yeah, to keep to keep it in in a bag that doesn't have symbols and like you know if you have a laptop you don't want to carry a bag that says laptop case mm -hmm. because then people know inside what, what we have right mm -hmm. um, so a nondescript bag right mm -hmm. that maybe doesn't have that situation what about some of these words like shoving jostling stuffing what does that mean what do those words mean dropping uh, is full of shoving shoving bags into the tight spots Maybe full, full. Uh, the inside back contents are full, full, full of contents back. Yeah, yeah. So when you shove a bag into a into a spot, you're saying like, you know, let's say you're on a bus or on a on a plane, mm -hmm. right? You know how often other people's luggage are near your luggage? They just mm -hmm. push your luggage wherever mm -hmm. they, they wherever they find space, mm -hmm. right? They'll throw your bag around. They'll put it in a corner. They'll put it on top of another bag, next to another bag. You know, you mm -hmm. have no idea where they're putting them, right? Mm -hmm. So jostling is the same kind of idea. Like jostling is like you're mixing something around. Like mm -hmm. two or three bags are getting mixed around. They're getting hit hit on the side. 
you know, in a bus, if, for example, maybe it hits the metal, uh, some metal container, some suitcase, you know. So it's a very delicate thing. Like, I, I never put my laptop with the other luggage. I always carry it with me, right? Mm-hmm. And it may be its own bag, you know, something like that. And then stuffing in just one more thing. So this is what you were saying, you know, putting just trying to put in one more thing into your bag, mm-hmm. right? We always do that, you know. Um, some people might say, you know, I can fit one more thing. Like I can fit my charger. I can fit my whatever, right? Mm-hmm. And if it's if it gets too heavy, or if you put too many things, then you can break your laptop, right? So mm-hmm. this is when they when they're saying you might hear an investment shattering crack, right? So your laptop is an investment, right? If you and it could shatter, it could break if you push a little too hard, right? Mm-hmm. So that's what they're saying here. Uh, have you ha- usually when you travel, Ken? How do you travel? How do you travel with maybe your laptop or any other kind of electronic device? Do you keep it with you, or do you put it in the in, in like the regular kind of luggage uh, with everything else? Yeah, I I a a you know <laughs> I use PC book to to the protection. Uh huh. And. I bring uh, my laptop to inside and uh, inside the uh, you know airplane mm-hmm. because it's it's safe because sometimes if I uh, you know uh, I heard some sometimes a uh, PC will be broken if I you know uh, if it is in the cargo of the airplane so I always bring my PC. With you, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, with you. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I think that's the smart thing to do because they can get damaged, very heavily damaged, mm-hmm. actually, if yeah. people are not, you know, being careful. Um, so the next section is turn it off, right? It's tough to pack a powerful computer into a tiny enclosure and then keep its critical components running nice and cool. That's what the numerous vents and fans that suck cool air in and push hot air out are for. Now imagine the heat that can accumulate in the secure, padded, tight quarters of a fancy new laptop bag, right? Don't make the mistake of cramming a sleeping computer into the confines of a backpack or messenger bag. Hibernating is not the same as being powered off. Heat is a computer's enemy number one. It can shorten your computer's useful life, loosen components in the motherboard, or entirely destroy it. Block the computer's vents for long stretches, and you could unpack a fried PC at the end of your trip. Be safe and power down that laptop laptop before you stow it. If you do discover that your laptop's temperature is to be on the rise, here are some suggestions for cooling it down. So he has another article where he talks about cooling it down. But what about these couple paragraphs here? Can any questions mm-hmm. about these? Maybe the heat is the, the most one of the most danger of the PC, so... Yeah, that's what cool, he kept saying. Cool, cool it down. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Cooling it down, or even just even... I mean, if you're not going to be using it, then just turn it off, right, when it's in the, mm. when it's in the bag, right? I see, right? Yeah. Um, Some computers, I know, my old computer, mm-hmm. it was a Dell, Dell laptop, mm-hmm. it got so hot, extremely hot. Mm. And even the bag that was that it was inside would get would feel mm. warmer when it was inside, right? Mm. So definitely, um, that's what keeps it different. That's what makes it you know difficult. Um, the next category is keep an eye on it, but keep it out of sight, right? Laptops are are hot ticket items for thieves. Keep yours on your lap or within view while you're at the airport, bus, or train terminal. Don't leave it. Don't leave it an open target by setting it on an adjacent seat and then becoming distracted by your phone or your kids. If it disappears, don't expect it to show up at the lost and found. Right? Mm -hmm. When traveling by car, keep your laptop hidden. Leaving it exposed on the passenger seat, even when getting out to pump gas, could be the perfect opportunity for a sticky-fingered individual to reach in and scoop up the loot. Keep it in the trunk, under the seat, or cover it with a jacket and keep your car locked at all times, mm-hmm. right? So you should definitely be keeping an eye on it, right? But don't don't keep it out in an obvious location because people will steal it, mm-hmm. right? So that's what they're saying here. Any questions on that part? 
No. Makes sense. Okay. Mm, makes sense. If, in spite of your best efforts, your laptop still winds up missing, you might be able to recover it, provided you install a program such as LoJack before you hit the road. Right? You'll find some other good recovery tips here. So this LoJack website has, I think, uh, it has anti-theft technology. So this is a screenshot from that from that laptop, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe it can lock down your computer so nobody can use it or see it mm -hmm. when you are, you know, when it's if it gets stolen. Mm -hmm. So let's see, back it up and lock it down. What could be worse than losing your laptop? Losing the information you have stored on it. Follow a backup regimen, keeping a copy of your important data on a hard drive at the home or office or in the cloud so you can pick up where you left off as soon as you can afford to replace the missing PC. Right? Mm -hmm. And what could be worse than losing the information stored on your laptop? Knowing some unsavory person has access to it. What's on your laptop? Contact information for friends, family, and colleagues, personal photos, banking and tax records, sensitive information about your business. Perhaps there's enough personal information and photos to let someone steal your identity. Protect yourself by locking it all down with a strong password and encryption. Right? Uh, store any written down passwords and sensitive data away from the laptop itself. It doesn't do too much. It doesn't do much good if the thief manages to snag the laptop and any information <clears throat> necessary to access what's stored on it. Right. So. But what about these three paragraphs, Ken? Any questions on these? Hmm. Yeah. You want oh, to keep maybe. your... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah maybe the set the password is, is safer. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. To prevent uh, other people use my computer or identity theft. Exactly, right? Don't put the passwords that you use to access your mm -hmm. different websites, laptops, whatever, <laughs> on your laptop, right? Because if someone steals it, then they have all that information, mm -hmm. right? And the best thing is just to encrypt the entire laptop with a strong password, right? So that mm -hmm. when they open it, they can't do anything. They can't, they don't have access to any of the information. Did we have someone join? Hey, Juan, how's it going? Hi, hi. Morning. Good morning, good morning. Uh, we're, so, Juan, we're looking at um, how to uh, take care of our laptops when we're traveling, right? So we've seen certain things like keeping it in a, in a nice bag, but uh, not, making the, not putting the bag in an obvious location, like maybe outside on the seat of your car or next to you because people can steal it, right? And then we also looked at, for example, backing up your laptop if it gets stolen, we looked at uh, turning the laptop off so it doesn't get too warm, right? And so we're looking at just one. We'll look at one last one here, and it's called, remember, you're in public, right? So when wandering between public Wi-Fi networks, it's easy to pick up hitchhikers in the form of viruses, malware, and data snoops, right? Make sure you have up-to-date antivirus and anti-spyware software installed and running in the background, right? Keep your firewall up. Keep your firewall up to block unsolicited connections to your PC. When connected to an unfamiliar network, it's sometimes best to be paranoid and treat everything like the enemy, right? So, going online for some last-minute holiday shopping or to check your bank account while you're on the road might seem like a good idea. But uploading personal information on the internet while using public Wi-Fi is asking for trouble, right? If possible, wait until you're on a secured network to do this sensitive stuff, right? If you must perform an online transaction, be sure the website address begins with HTTPS and that there's a locked padlock icon in the corner of the browser window or in the address bar itself, indicating that you're connected to a secure site, right? So see how... In this, in this screenshot, we see whenever you have the HTTPS and you have this lock at the beginning, right, that shows that it's a secure site, right? So we want to be sure about those kinds of things. Because what can happen on a public Wi-Fi network? I mean, can you know, is your information safe if you're on a public Wi-Fi network? Mm, I don't think so. Because it's, I, I heard it's easy to hack. 
It is very much easy, mm -hmm. right? So if you're uploading something, if you're downloading something, those can get intercepted if you're on a public network, and uh, you know they can cause lots of problems, lots of problems within the context of what whatever you're purchasing. Maybe you're purchasing something. Maybe you're on your bank account, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of that sensitive information can be can be stolen or can be intercepted, right? So. Crap. Okay. So then, that's that's all I wanted to mention, guys, in terms of the article, right? And I was going to uh, ask you guys. So Juan, when you are traveling, how do you how do you take care of your technology? How do you keep it safe? Yeah, phone or tablet or laptop. How do you keep that stuff away from thieves? That's what I wonder because I never know how to do it. How, what about? I mean, like in the past, have you? Have you done anything specific? No. Really? You just do you keep it in a like a special kind of bag or do you No, no, no. To say the truth, I never lived with this problem. I don't know, maybe I an easy to hack because I never take care of them. I know very familiar with the technology now. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Interesting. Well, maybe do you see your kids kids carry their their kind of their electronics? How do they do it? If they're traveling, if they're leaving the house, coming back, are are there strategies that they use so that things don't get stolen? The kids? Yeah, like your children, for example. I know you said your son was uh, into technology. He does a lot with technology and computers. So do you know how they travel with their laptops? Yeah, but I I never ask him. Never ask him. Uh -huh. Oh yeah. Yeah, I think generally, I mean, most of these, most young people today, like when I travel, I have a little bit of a, I have a small case that I keep my laptop in. The case is in a bag, is in a bigger bag, right? And that mm -hmm. bag, that bag doesn't have any symbols that it's a laptop. It's just a normal backpack, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. I have never. I never had that problem because I don't use lap. I use only my Dex computer. Desktop computer, uh -huh. that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, some folks definitely don't have that problem. My my mom, for example, has never used. She has never carried around a laptop. When she uses a computer, it's something inside the house, like the the desktop computer, especially. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, all guys like me. <laughs> exactly. My mom is a. Uh, I don't know. I don't think you guys are old. I think you guys just don't have the need really to have a laptop with you. You know, um, yeah. if you because if you're most most of the time if you find yourself near home, then you know you can use your desktop. Uh, desktops are much more powerful. In, you know, most of them. I know that. Um, for example, my son is. He has a tablet. He has a laptop. He has a computer desk, and I ask. Why? Why do you have all that stuff? Uh, I, because I need it. But uh, I never know why. For example, when I travel, I never, I, I don't use computers at all. So. Yeah, it's a matter I think of convenience actually, because I I can say the same thing, uh, Juan. I have a tablet, I have a phone, I have a laptop. All three. Nobody else uses them. I use all three, right? But I can't use them at the same time, right? Uh, I am just one person, right? But I think it's a matter of convenience. If you're if you're on the road or if you're traveling a lot, then sometimes you need the you need the extra kind of alternatives, right? You need the tablet, maybe if you're on a flight, or the phone. If you're the phone, we use all the time, right? Everywhere. Yeah. Um, and the, the laptop is more when you like when I'm doing classes, for example, I'm trying to do that from a laptop. So. A little bit of differences, I guess. We have some reasons to do what we do. Yeah. <laughs> there, there, there is a method for our behind our madness, right? We you, use this. You are really, really merry with the technology. <laughs> oh, so much, so much. I tell, I tell people when they ask me how should they contact me, I say contact me on Gmail or whatever, uh, because I am Gmail is my wife. I'm married to Gmail. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? Like whatever, yeah. whatever happens on Gmail, I'll, I'll know. You know, within you five minutes. It's very important uh, because when I try to connect with my son, uh, I just send a message, and he asks me. But when I try to uh, call uh, to make a call. Uh, he never answered her phone. Yeah. 
answering answering calls is too is too old technology for us now, corn. You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, we <laughs> we only that. we only listen to emails now. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's true. It's crazy but true. Um, Ken, what about you? So we were talking about other strategies. Have you ever had problems with? Did you did you ever notice anybody covet your laptop or covet any technology that you had? Mm, fortunately, not. Yeah. Okay. Mm. I feel like Japan is really safe. You know, mm. like if you're driving around or walking around in Japan, even if you have technology, I don't think people steal stuff in Japan. Uh, but some safety is still happening. So, yeah, not you know, uh, put a computer in obvious. You know, side side you know side seat or front front uh, front front window it uh-huh. could be attractive for theft. Yeah, it could be very yeah. attractive. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of the, um, I guess the next thing I wanted to ask was when you traveled internationally, mm-hmm. like when you came to the U.S., what did you do? Did you take any special precautions? If you find yourself in a new area or in a new city, maybe mm-hmm. do you do you take special steps? Not exactly. I just, but I, I always uh, take a bath uh, after dawn, after you know, after sunset. I I, I didn't walk outside uh, at night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I always take a campus bus, campus circulating bus, or or but yeah, but uh, sometimes I walk because yeah, just be beside the dormitory, a uh, sports center. Sports team and pool uh, beside the dormitory. So I walk there. Many students walk there on foot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and I asked the, about that to the university's uh, you know staff. So she she answered. Uh, she don't care about. She walk on w- walking down the campus even at uh, at night. But uh, maybe it might be then it could be dangerous. And my outlook is a kind of. For foreigners, so it could be vulnerable, to more easy target. So yeah, that's uh, her answer. Yeah. Uh, mm. No, that's really good, man. It's really good that you had you talk, not only talked with the university folks, but you were very cautious about laptop mm-hmm. safety. I know in the dorms when I was a college student. There were a lot of problems, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. Stuff got stolen mm-hmm. all the time, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, people. And now they most desks, like most uh, desks in the actual dorms. If you if you look at a student mm-hmm. desk, they have a little laptop lock, which is like this. Mm-hmm. You know how if you want to lock your lock your bicycle, lock your mm-hmm. bike, oh, yeah. they, have that, they have that lock, right? So mm-hmm. a lot of laptops, actually, I don't know about mine, but some laptops have a little lock hook mm-hmm. that you can put the mm-hmm. laptop lock to. And you can stick it literally. You just stick it mm. to your desk. So if somebody needs to remove your laptop, they need to mm. take the desk too, you know. Mm. Uh, which I don't think anybody would do. But I'm sure you can cut a lock like that, right? Mm. I mean, people cut bike locks all the time. You know, um, mm. number one way your bike gets <laughs> bike gets stolen, probably, right? Mm. So I guess we do have to be cautious when we use technology in um, in these kinds of ways. But uh, I don't know. I mean. Just be safe, right? Being safe is better than being sorry, I guess. Mm. Another one, another one we say in English: better safe than sorry. Kind of a kind of one of those phrases, right? Um, so yeah. Besides that, guys, I wanted to know: were there any other questions about about the article? Or we looked at the pronunciation too or, um, earlier in the in the class one. Um, so the pronunciation of letters of vowels that come before R. So we looked at a bunch of different examples. Um, but any questions on on the laptop stuff, guys, or opinions or ideas about how to keep them safe? Mm. <laughs> Maybe lock could be, yeah, on the public such kind of lock, uh, you know, on the public space. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's good. Usually, yeah, a good. library or public space here doesn't have such kind of lock. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but it's good. It's good to have it as an option, right? At the very mm, least. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Juan, anything else you wanted to say or would like to share? No, no, no. Okay. Cool, guys. Well, um, great class, guys. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, I have I have another class in an hour, so hopefully I can see you guys then. 
Thank you very much. Okay. Awesome, guys. Take, take care. care. Bye. Yeah, take care. Okay, Ken. Bye. Bye.